it over to Alja Cordes. Um, now I'm back to doing something different. Um, so you, you should know probably about the synopsis. It's to kind of um, tell you about the, ta the challenges of localization in the casual games industry, as opposed to maybe other areas that you might be working in at the moment, other areas that you're translating or developing or anything like that. So can I just get a quick straw poll just as a general information of, of who's here? Um, is there any developers here? Um, translators? Um, kind of, I know there's a few vendors here kind of handling translation and engineering on the part too. Lots. <laughs> um, <laughs> how are you? Um, is there anybody here who's kind of involved in project management or coordination or anything like that? <laughs> I'll be asking a quiz at Is there anyone else from any other kind of a background that I've mentioned? Uh, training. Training? Oh, great. In, in what kind of area? It's the Master of Arts and Applied Translation Studies at Leeds, so we've got a chat on Oh, okay.
crazy email from my uh, co colleague in uh, Seattle and then kind of the guy to go and walk the crowd. Um, yeah. it's, it's not supposed to paralyze you, it's supposed to make you kind of work. Um, so this was uh, uh, Bernice Johnson uh, Reagan, who's um, she's a kind of a singer, a cappella singer in America. And no, I didn't spend just three hours looking for clothes I figured. <laughs> But the reality is deliberate, of course. Um, does anyone know what's actually going on? And then we've got a uh, deliberate boss here, and he's saying, um, then we program the website using a fast guy in tights and a movie about coffee, because hey, it's that sexy. And then he turns out, deliberate is like, correct me if I'm wrong. I get this a lot from my boss. Um, <laughs> and and deliberate is like, kind of going, well, actually, no, we, we use Flash in a JavaScript, and, and your man is like, if I said it. So th this is probably what a lot of you is. Uh, Probably the number one challenge in anyone's life is um, the, the, the other people involved who think they know what's happening due to the reality of the probably have a fair gist of it, but they probably don't really know what's going on because you're on the cold face. Um, this is the first challenge anyone's going to hit. Um, and I'm not saying bosses are evil, I'm a lead, so. <laughs> I'm a lead of a bunch of translators, and I'm not a translator. So uh, the number one challenge for them is to convince me, you know, this is why um, I want to spend my time translating, and this is why I want to play the game for another hour, and I'm, I'm not convinced about this, um, and so on. And for me, my challenge with them, I think, is communication. So I think you overcome a lot of this, good communication, and an understanding of what's going on. Clearly here, uh, guy hasn't a clue what goes into the website and he's trying to sell it to his client and you know it's really sex stuff kind of a thing. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of hard stuff going on in the background which no one seems to realise. Um, I remember um, one of my first jobs when I came out of college, um, so I got a computer science degree, it's my background. I had uses of computers, um, couldn't program to save my life, I not actually how UCC got me out of the place with a degree. But um, I knew how to write uh, HTML code, which these days sounds crazy because it's all ASP and .php and all this kind of crap. Uh, back then it was literally, you know, um, HTML, open brackets, and then you know, your image source, and it was all fairly rudimentary. And you could have actually written it in a Word document, a stated as a HTML file. Um, someone, a guy I went for an interview with told me that, and he said, you know, this is the selling point coming to me saying you can write HTML code. He said, you know, my administration secretary out there can do that too. Um, she can do it on front page because this is back in 1999. Front page was a big winner at the time for uh, writing HTML code. And um, yeah, and I was sitting there in Dublin going, crap, am I going to ever get a job out here? It's the only thing I know. And I love graphics and all that, but I was really bad at graphics. I love, I love looking at pretty things, but I can't actually work with them. Um, so, um, yeah, so I was kind of going, oh no, you know, it's, it's like, it's that point when you're looking for a job and you've been looking for a job for months and you're like, oh god, I'm going to be living in my parents' house for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he came out and was like, ah, oh, no, no, you're one out there, you know, she can, she's great, she can do it on front page, you know, what are you sitting here wasting my time for? And I came out of there and walked across the road to Vista Tech, who's a vendor in Dublin, and they're still there. And I uh, got into a great debate with the guy interviewing me there about uh, Phantom Menace, which had just come out, and the, the merits of Star Wars. And uh, he said, you know, this is great. You can write HTML code. Uh, I'll give you a job testing HTML pages, because you need to know about HTML code for that. And I was like, what are you talking about? Testing pages. And that's how I ended up in localization. Um, had the clue, never heard it before. And actually, my uncle was working in the area for 10 years before this, but he was telling me something about localizing games and localizing uh, children's software. And I thought it meant that he was changing the keys on the keyboard. So that, like, you know, if you press A and in French, it might be a different letter. Right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so basically, that's the whole thing. The guy in the recruitment agency across the road, his, his opinion was, you know nothing, you know, the skills that you have, they're, they're not applicable. But he didn't know anything about localization. Whereas in this attack across the road, they know about localization, obviously, because they're running it, and it's their bread and butter. And they were able to identify what's happening. Now, I didn't actually end up in 
there, um, I ended up in another company. But what I'm saying is that um, knowledge is key to what goes on, and I'd advise anyone who's involved in gaming and in translation and looking to get training in any of these kind of areas, kind of learn a little bit about what's going on in the different stages, because it can help it can help save you a lot of sanity, and also it can help you see what's going on with everyone else. Um, I'm a project manager in Big Fish Games, and I've been a project manager now for the last three years maybe, um, in different companies. And knowing what goes on really kind of helps me a lot, because at least, even from the point of view of dealing with people and listening to their worries and their complaints, you kind of know where they're coming from, because that's their interest and that's their speciality. And everyone thinks that their role in the whole system is the most important role. And as a project manager, I think you're kind of in the center of everything, and, and you're the one who has to pull all the, the, the team together, basically. It's a real team building. Um, so yeah, so what are these roles in the localization cycle? Um, so the same kind of got the project manager or the coordinator or there's different companies and different people. Some people might have a team lead who does different areas. Some some projects might be so small that you have dual roles. Um, this is kind of where I'm coming from. That we're kind of in the middle of what's going around. And linking in, you've got the developer. Now, as I was saying already, we actually have. Um, I don't deal with the developer in the current role. It's a colleague of mine. He would be a project manager as well. Okay, so anyway, we're in contact with the developer there. Um, you've got the engineer, so the localization engineer, um, any other kind of engineering capacity kind of people. You've got the translators, right? Because you're localizing, and you're not using translation. Um, oh, what do you call it? Computer translation mm -hmm. or machine translation? Uh, we don't use this in casual things. So um, yeah, Google Translation is your enemy in casual things. <laughs> no, it's great, but I've, I've come to it because I was actually I was at a Nordic game recently, which is the the. Um, I don't, is anyone here from Scandinavian countries? So in Scandinavia, they, they're doing a huge drive for uh, hardcore gaming mostly, and they the, all the culture ministers sat down and said, right, you know, um, here we are in the north of Europe, and it's Iceland as well, obviously. I sat with them and Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. And they said, right, you know, um, if we've got industry here that we need to develop, and you know, there's a lot of gaming companies up there, hardcore gaming and casual gaming, and there's some social gaming going on as well. And they said, right, you know, what are we going to do here? And they, they basically created this kind of um, group called Nordic Game, and they give them money, and they help fund competitions within the different gaming companies, and it's to promote um, gaming companies is to help get, get the little guy basically a step on the ladder and um, oh it's, it's really really cool um, they throw like millions of euro in behind them um, to get them all going and the, the northern Europe industry is, is quite strong now at the moment because they've got a lot of backing I was out, I, I knew one person at this, I was invited to speak at a, at a, a seminar and uh, everyone knew each other like it's it's crazy and um, it's, it's really integration so it's they don't do a lot of localization yet, but I mean it's it's going on up there and it's and that's what you need, it's that whole kind of collaboration thing. But anyway, sorry, yeah, uh, so you've got your developer, engineer, you've got your translator, which is flexible. Um, and you've got your tester. So this is the QA person at the end, um, this is the linguistic tester, um, the this could be the proofreader. If you've got a big translation, um, that's who's taking the government. So everyone's kind of inter interacting with the project manager, and they're kind of separate here, but obviously there's a lot of interaction between um, some of them as well. In Big Fish, the engineer will be dealing with the developer as well, giving them tips on how to develop um, future things. And translators, obviously, talking to the engineer, you know, um, my kit is corrupt, how do you fix it? Um, the tester is probably that the translator is actually looking at the game, it doesn't have a lot of translation in any description. And then the project managers in the middle lighting candles and maps every Sunday. <laughs> so, 
so uh, yeah. Um, but the other problem, that's in, in, in your island. Uh, uh, so, so this is kind of who's involved. Actually, this is your That's who's involved there, okay? Um, but who else is involved? You've got your customer, okay? They're not like buying our games. Uh, we're not making a whole lot of money. Um, so they have to be kind of kept happy. You've got the boss. Um, so that could be in our in, in Big Fish. We've got um, the, the guy who set up the company, Paul Thielen, who's now a strategy officer. He's very involved in, in the localization side as well. Um, and we've got a few other um, stakeholders involved too. We're quite a small company, like 450 people basically. Um, so they all come to, to visit us in Cork and we get to go back to Seattle with them. So the boss could be any number of people involved who's definitely interested in what's going on because they're really interested in what the customer is buying because then they would get to have a fancy car. Um, and also, they're probably the person who set up the company in the first place and they've got a very big vested interest in what's going on. Um, so yeah, so the boss is an important one. Um, then you've got the leads. So as I was saying, I'm a project manager, but I'm also a lead of a whole bunch of translators who I have no idea, but they do what they do. So what I speak is a bit of Irish. Um, uh, so this person here can get a bit tricky as well. Um, and then you've got the managers as well. So my manager doesn't really know what I do. Um, so, so as you see, there's a lot of people involved here. Not a lot of people know it, but it doesn't. And it's just a matter of convincing everyone that you're doing the right job. Going around. Um, so, yeah. so, uh, so there are the roles that are involved, and obviously hugely diverse. I mean, you know, you go to Microsoft up to Dublin, and they've got like thousands of people working there, localization area, and then you've got micro, micro, micro um, tasks and roles going on there. This would be kind of quite a high level, and this is what we have in Big Fish Games at the moment. Our department is quite small. We've got uh, 26 people at the moment in Cork. We've 20 three translators, and we've got two leads, and a uh, localization engineer. So it's pretty small, um, we run a tech shop. Um, in Seattle then, there's the, the, the guy who does the developers, and there's the testers, and, and that all go on over there. So obviously, um, it can get a little bit disconnected sometimes, but you just have to deal with that. As I was saying before, communications, if you're not a good communicator, uh, you, you'll have a lot of problems down the line and it's really important to set up a good communication channel. Um, we have a very good relationship with um, all our developers and so we can we have a mechanism where we can give them feedback and they take things on board with what we ask them to do. Our developers um, can cause us a lot of problems and this is one of the things to bear in mind if you are um, thinking about going into translation for casual games. <coughs> developing for casual games, um, we've got people who literally you've got the guy living um, in you know Russia or somewhere like that because you get a lot of Eastern European um, developers and they're literally working out of their parents' garage. Kind of um, but they develop this really cool game and we find them or they find us and we end up localizing the game. Or you've got the likes of your play first, um, <coughs> big conglomerates are churning out games in the left, right, center. And, and then, you know, you're, we're dealing with them as well here in the development point of view. And the engineer will also need to give them feedback because maybe we're translating for Travis, but maybe somebody else that they deal with is translating with a different tool or not using a tool at all. So it's all about educating, um, educating them in what we're doing and how we want to deal with them and how we want them to develop for us in a way that would suit their other clients as well. Um, so, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so, here you've got like your translation cycle here, right? Um, the developer, first of all, the number one challenge is what's localization, what's internationalization. I came up with a computer science degree, my uncle was working in localization for 10 years, I, mean, I still haven't clue what, what it was all about. Um, probably if you're living on mainland Europe, you'll know that there's your language. I know there's another one over here called English that a lot of these computer companies are hoping to sell their product in. And then you've got America, who 
few things. Hey, our language is English. What's, what, what do you mean you don't? What? Um, and, and then you've got the salespeople who you're trying to convince if you go and sell our product in Germany or France or Spain or wherever else, you'll make money on this. I was working in Oracle for five years and I started working in Oracle in 2000 and this was back in the days when translation was deemed a luxury. Localization, localizing your product, it's a luxury. Uh, Corel had friends working in there and they were all basically locked out of their office when they coming back from lunch. Um, allegedly because they were closing down the office and they were going to be heading back to, to, to move their, their localization department back to their headquarters because it made more sense. They weren't the only ones. There were so many people and so many friends of mine were all out of work because of this. It was the whole dot com bust back in 2001 after 9 11 and 2002. Um, companies started saying, right, we don't want to spend money anymore. What's the first thing to go? The luxury items. It's the translation. Hey, everyone can kind of figure out the English if they have to. Let's just sell it in English and see where it goes. One of the biggest challenges at the time was to actually sell the concept of we need to sell, you know, we want to have our product in, in a different language. Um, so they'd say, okay, let's go for a fix, you know, or French, German, um, Italian, Spanish. Half of South America's Spanish speaking, you know, would make some money there. Um, and, and that was kind of the basic core of languages. Um, in Oracle, they had a few um, Asian languages as well, and that was their core set of languages. And after that, then they'd expand to include European languages, Middle Eastern, um, Russian, um, Polish, all those kind of languages as well. But I mean, it was such a slog at the time. Um, that was the biggest challenge, probably, at the time. And also the fact that, uh, you know, people just didn't really understand what was going on. In Oracle, 60%, I think, at the time of their sales was actually to the European market. So we had a pretty strong position of saying, don't fire us, you know, we'll keep translating here and, and people are going to buy our product. Um, nowadays, it's become a lot more acceptable that there's translation out there. And partly, I think, it's because of the whole machine translation. Um, and, and this is one of the problems with developers. First of all, they're kind of going, what, what do you mean? Well, like, what is translation? What is internationalization? Asher, listen, we've shown him to, you know, freetranslation.com or, you know, Google Translation, this kind of thing. And there are games out there that we know, well, I wouldn't know because I don't speak any other language. But my translators would look at it and just start crying and say, like, you know, no one ever loves this game. And it's just, it's French, but it's French. Um, so, from the developer point of view, when they're developing their game, it's really important that somebody's talking to them about translation and about what they need to expect because they're going to go off and they're going to write loads and loads of code about things and they're going to embed strings that need to be translated in the middle of stuff that a cat to is never ever going to find. So it's really, really important that if you're a developer um, that you're thinking about this, it's important if you're somebody who's interested in engaging a developer that you talk to them and find out what exactly it is they're doing. Um, are they using standard XML code? I mean, we get a lot of games in and um, our word counts tend to be anything from a thousand words up to maybe 20,000 words. Our average is in around the 15,000 mark. We get XML files. I'd say every day we get a different version of an XML file. And I'm not a coder, but I remember being taught XML at one point and it looked like Standard. But now they have everything and anything in it. And some people kind of seem to do their own languages depending on the engine that they want. So this is really, really important. And this is one of the biggest headaches of the localization engineer. If the developer doesn't really know what's going on and they've localized the, or they've made a game basically, and someone sees it and says, hey, you know, we want to buy your game and we make you loads of cash as well if, if we localize it, the developer is like, happy days, you know, I'll get to get an apartment now and meet my mother's kitchen. And the mother's going, brilliant, get out the door, take the deal. And then your man is in his new swanky pad, trying to develop his next game. And then the localization engineer is coming back going, um, could you give us some reference files, please? Uh, do you achieve those? Oh, what's this XML business? Um, why does it open in, a, in an Excel file? I don't know what the hell is going on. And this guy up here is going, no, no, hang on, I have to pay my electricity bill. I need to keep going with this other game. And, and so then you've got a problem here where 
this guy here doesn't want to talk to this person here because he thinks that game is great, it works fine. And somebody told me it can be translated. This guy down here is going, I have no idea what's happening. And I don't know what's going to happen if you put this into Travis or Catalyst or whatever it to me. So communication is key and that this person here kind of knows what's happening. If this person here doesn't know what's going on, they're going to be in trouble. So at the moment we have a system where we could have oh, people like up to 500 developers that we do with. And with each of those developers, they have a different way of developing the game. They tend to have a standard way, but you do get your pages that come out and you just don't know what's happening. Um, so we, we constantly give feedback for different developers, particularly our regular developers, so that they know what's happening. They know what we want to see when we get a localization. Um, so, in relation to education and like translation and the whole world, their coding languages, their development cycle is another one and, and they're, they're kind of their game plan. We get a lot of these guys and they're, it's their baby. It's their first game or it's their second game because their first game went really well and, and, and they were getting loads of money to make another one. They don't want to let go and, and you're there trying to translate the game and then they come out with an update, the update. And it's in a different language, coding language. And I've seen this, and we've even had this internally with our own developers. We have a studio internally here. We were translating one of their games recently, and it was in XML. And then they decided, hey, let's go and change it to Flash. And we were like, hang on, Flash. You know, we're going to have loads of problems here leveraging translations and, and redoing the whole works. So it's good if this person here is involved in giving feedback on the development cycle. Well. This is very true if the game has, hasn't actually been launched. Now at Big Fish, we tend to translate games after they've been launched, so we don't tend to run into too many problems with the development cycle. But when you're doing simultaneous releases, it's really important to be on top of what the developer is doing. When I worked in Oracle, um, we used to do a lot of simultaneous releasing. So when the US project went down to the shelf, also in France, the French project went down the shelf in Germany and so on. And I used to work in their user assistance, which is the help, you know, you press your F1 to get the help documentation. And halfway through translating everything, they decided to get rid of one of their tools. So we translated like thousands of words for this help, for this tool, and, and the developer said, I you know what, it's not working, let's bring it out to the next release or let's merge it with another release. And that was a huge wastage. But the developers weren't really involved in what was happening at the time. I, I think that it was being communicated to them, you know, we're now translating this, is the code frozen. So it's really important to know what's going on up here in the development cycle. Because somebody somewhere is going to end up wasting money, whether it's the developer, in a social games point of view, in a, in a casual games, chances are it's the company selling the game, so Big Fish, for example. We're the ones who are going to make some money there because we're paying these guys, obviously. Um, so it's really important that this person here has a fairly tight fist on, on the development cycle, or you're definitely going to run into problems. And then their game plan in general, you know, um, basically what's happening. Are they planning on um, bringing out another release? How do they base this release? We translated, translated the game recently that they recycled the code from the previous game and didn't cut out chunks of the code that they didn't need. And then we were there barely translating away the previous title that we didn't realize because we'd never done that title. Huge waste of time. So this person here really needs to know what's going on. Then the engineer, so the localization engineer, um, they're kind of, again, they might not necessarily be in your world. Um, they're in our world because we've got so many games coming through. We need somebody to look at the games and stick them into Travis or put them in a way that, that translations can make sense of them and translate with them. So they're using their cat tools. We use Travis, as I'm saying. Um, a lot of companies might develop their own tool if they're doing enough translation that entails them um, having a particular tool to fit the particular file type. Automation is becoming a big thing in our place at the moment. Uh, I've worked in companies before that was using automation, um, like Transworld servers out there, ATM, and any of those kind of ones. Automation is a big problem, I believe, in casual games because of all the developers. So as I was saying, you know, we're dealing with everything up to 500 developers. They've all got a different way to skin a cat. And if you've got a cat tool that would say XML, you know, it will pick it up if it's between these double quotes and it's preceded by this particular 
guys keep educating them, keep um, telling them what you want to see, um, encourage them to have a particular file type. So at least if you're planning an auction meeting, if you're planning on going down the route of you know pushing the button and the lock is fed in and things happen and translators get a lovely kit that they can translate, well then the engineer needs to be really on top of what is coming in from the developer so that there are no surprises and you don't end up sending a whole bunch of translations to the poor old tester down here who's a uh, tool of English because this particular string didn't get picked up by the tool or this particular chunk of text had a comma in the middle of it that wasn't expected and so on. Um, so this is probably the biggest headache of the localization engineer. Hi. Would it be easier or could be Visible to have a mean house developer uh, <coughs> specialized in CAD tools and also in communicating with the general developers. And this the in house developer could be how to say, prepared to, to clean up these um, different um, markups and code and codings in order to be able to prepare the input to be used with capsules. It wouldn't be easier having this specialized developer in using this input. To so having an in-house developer would be great, except for the fact that the in our place we get maybe six or seven handoffs of games and they could be all different formats. Um, so we have a very tight deadline then, you know, I mean, you can't get a game in and sit there for the next couple of months while the files get cleaned up. So that's why we don't have the luxury of doing that. Um, so what we try and do is we try and give the feedback after every game and tell them, tell the developers, this is what we'd like to see in the future, this is what we don't. It's good if the localization engineer comes from a different background. Um, so, yeah, as you say, if they come from a development background, which our guy does come from a development background, maybe they have a bit of testing experience so they know what the testers run into. Even if they have a bit of translation experience so they know the kind of problems as a translation unit as well. It's really important that this guy here knows something about the other roles because they're the ones who kind of um, cats in a bag kind of thing, you know, they, they, they're the ones who really try and, and, and it's, they're the ones that will hit every single problem that's going to happen in the localization kit because if they don't hit it, no one else is going to see it until it gets to the testing side. So yeah, no, it would be great to get the developers in, but unfortunately, um, in, our, in our department anyway, we just don't have that luxury. It may happen in other departments, I'm not sure. But the nature of casual games is that they're very, very short lead times, so you just don't have the luxury for them, unfortunately. It's an idea to bring back to the boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so talking about the engineer, um, the engineer has got his cap tools, he's got his updates and source control. This is a huge thing. Um, updates from these guys up here would cause you endless problems if you don't have a good source control system. You don't even have to have, like, I mean, I worked in companies before that had particular check-in, check-out tools and all massive um, CRM systems or CSM systems, all this. Something as simple as a good folder structure that makes sense, you know. Um, you'd be amazed, I mean, when I first came to Big Fish, um, we were just getting started on the whole translation side. I mean, we've only been going two years and I've been there now, a year and a half. Everything was just piled in, you know, from, from translators up in there, uh, German and French and all this. And then the proofreader was sitting there going, is this the proofread? I'm not really sure, you know. <laughs> For proofreading, and another folder, you know, proofread. Um, it, it's, it sounds really basic, but you'd be amazed because when you've got a small team, you might have one translator, they're doing everything. They don't need to know what's going on, but you need like, you need to think big, you know, I mean, okay, you might be a one-man show, but you, you want to try and think what happens in the future if I do take on another person, or I get an assistant, or I get the in-house developer. You need to have something that's scalable, ideally, so you don't have to go back then and use your archive and 
start trying to scale everything in there because you have a new release coming out of something that you translated three years ago. So scalability is something you really need to think about in the whole organization of what you do. And as I said, like, you know, we don't want to spend money. If you're not spending money, you're saving money. There's an ad on radio for one saying that. And it makes sense. These, you, you know, if you think about what you're doing and you enlist the stakeholders in what's going on, you can get a fairly good solution for what's happening using, you know, folders. I use, I'm a great fan of Excel. I Excel color codes everything. I'm currently using MS Project, um, which is a kind of a pricey tool, but it gives a very visual way of what's going on and people know what's happening. Um, Gantt charts, all that kind of stuff. Um, and like, use a naming convention as well. Uh, one of the problems that we had when we first started was nobody knew, for example, with Danish, what's the language extension? Some people were using DA, some people were using DK. Um, Swedish, SV, SE, SW, no one knew what to use. So we had all these different folders with different names and language extensions were going back to the developers and what was going on? And then some people would type ES by accident instead of SE, and then it's a Spanish. So it's, it's really important to be organized with what you're doing and um, have somebody who's sane and knows something about an industry standard, right? Because you want to be scalable. Um, we have Brazilian, and we started using PT. I was like, sure, we can't use PT. That's Portuguese. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but it's Portuguese. It's like, well, what happens if you translate for Iberian Portuguese in the future? We're going to be really confused now because we've got PT everywhere. So we changed it to the art, which was what it should have been given in the first place. Actually, to be honest, yeah. the two language identifier is great in there. I'd always go for the four, sorry, the two, two letter identifier. I'd always go for the four letter, the Java type identifier, because at least that way you can't go wrong. Um, and you've got your language and you've got your country. And at least if you've got 10 different versions of Swedish, you know, they'll know what to do. There's an ISO standard on that, on the two letters. Yeah, I don't like them. I don't like them either. <laughs> I, I'm used to three letters, but I'm not a boss. I'm not a boss. The boss, yeah. Yeah, you like them. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, again, it depends what you're doing. Like, we were getting Java files from people with an ISO number, and I'm like, but why don't you put in the Java? So it's, you see, a, a lot of the problem here is that you've got people coming in here who don't know what this is about. Um, they come in here from a different, you know, they've gone sideways in a road somewhere, and somebody somewhere said, which is what happened to me, I was a localization engineer, and they said, hey, you're organized, you can use Excel, manage a budget, and come a PM. And I was like, Jesus, I don't know what, what. I, I can't communicate with people, I, I'm really bad at emailing people, I, I don't know what to say. So, you know, I got dragged kicking and screaming into here. Um, <laughs> to me was you'll get a job in Cork eventually so I was like that. Oh, okay. But um, no I mean it is it's it's important that somewhere somewhere knows something about localization. I mean there's a huge resource um Lisa.org which is in my website unfortunately it's the localization industry established as an art I think. Um, they've got a lot of information on what you can do. Um, Wikipedia Google all these kind of ones you know they'll tell you what the standards are. If you don't get um, things right up here, and you don't try and clean the situation up down here, your translator is just going to keep you forever. Because they're going to be sitting there picking strings out and, is this double code for me, or is it part of code? And then it comes to the tester, and the tester goes off the game and nothing works because all the code is broken. So, you know, it's there's, there's a cycle of, going on here that is a huge challenge within companies, but if you can communicate between the different areas here, you know, it's a lot of headaches. By the way, if anyone here is, isn't actually involved in any of this, um, don't be scared, because it, it does work. Um, what was that web website again, please? Um, Lisa, and I asked Lisa, but it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work anymore. No, 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 no,
example, your Mahjong uh, match three, those games tend to be quite small because they don't tend to have a massive storyline. The workout would mostly be in the help section or in the tutorial, um, or there might be a bit of a background story. Your hidden object games, time management adventures, they tend to have a lot more story. You get drawn into what's going on, you know, um, someone got kidnapped and, and then the, their mother got murdered and the next year they ran away with the captain. You know, loads of different things going on. And these games tend to be really big and they're quite engaging. And this is where um, our bread and butter is in at the moment. Um, so for, for us, um, sorry, I totally forgot my <laughs> Um, anyway, yeah, so, so you've got your hidden objects and all that anyway, and um, yeah, I don't know if anyone played with these games. So, yeah, so you've got like really engaging dialogue, this is how this works. You've got dialogue, you've got um, tutorials, you've got general people talking to each other. Um, so, for example, if you're into hidden objects here, right? Um, mystery, huge at the moment, every single title coming to us is the mystery of something. Um, last year it was the curse, and um, the year before that it was something else. Um, we, we have people complaining to us about curses and mysteries and all this, and they think we should, we're in league with the devil basically. But, um, this is just what happens. So here, right, you've got Emmett the Inventor, kind of quite fairly lighthearted. Um, we've got Spirits of Mystery, a lot more fantasy. We've got this one here, Shiver, Vanishing Hitchhiker, kind of a contemporary, kind of creepy game. Um, Snark Busters, kind of, again, light-hearted, but a bit out there. You know, you've got all these different types of, of games going on here. Antique Road Trip, it's, they all pile into a, a, a Winnebago or something and go off across America. Um, Treasures of Mystery Island, the ghost ship, it's really, really creepy kind of game. So, you might be able to tell it from the title if you're translating it, it's a mystery of this, oh, it's going to be really creepy and stylish and atmospheric. But you don't actually know until you play the game. So we always advise everybody to play for an hour or whatever just to get a taster of what's going on. Because you might have a string that says, uh, you know, uh, hey mom, where's the cat? But it could be like, hey mom, where's the cat? Or, you know, something, you know, something completely casual. Or, you know, they're, they're locked into a cabinet and they're shouting out, you know. You don't know what context it's in. Whereas, if you're doing machine translation and you're translating um, a tractor manual, mm -hmm. how many styles are going to be there in a tractor manual? Or even easier systems of, of the software too. I mean, if, I'm, if I go in here and you know, look at my Windows Help here, here are some of the ways that Internet Explorer makes, you know, I mean, you could probably use machine translation for that. Like, you're not going to really mess it up too much. Um, but if this is like in the middle of some game and their magician is trying to murder the gypsy or something, well then you might have a different tone to it, you see. So um, this is why we insist on translators playing the game. So yeah, so it's really important that they decide on linguistic style. Uh, we do Danish, and there's a big, I don't know if you want to hear this Danish? <laughs> A big drama at the moment with Danish and there's some drama rule that involves a comma or not a comma. Now, I'm an English speaker, English is like whatever goes really good. Um, so, uh, yeah, they, they have this debate at the moment between two translations and they, they, they picked a style and stuck with it, and then they communicate that to whoever else is translating. Um, so, the linguistic style is, is quite important to kind of nail down so that moving forward in any other things you're translating, there's a consistency. I mean, you know, we're, we're hoping to be translating in 10 years' time, and we're going to be translating sequels to games, we're going to be translating for hopefully the same player, we'll be translating for, or we'll be playing for the next 10 years. And, you know, we want them to be happy with the particular style, because if they're going to play a particular type of game, they want to see that style again. They don't, they don't want surprises. Sometimes localization is kind of a double-edged sword because you're trying to reach out to your customer, but if you do it badly, they will hate you forever, and they will write everything they can about you on your forums, on their blogs, everywhere. Um, so you need to kind of find the style that's really good and then nail it and then stick to it as well. And as I was saying already, the game type is, is another important one. You know, get your game type right, or else you're off translation down a completely wrong path. You know, what's the point then? Um, the last
language as well. Um, make sure the spellings are correct. You know, it's amazing. Um, if you're not using the correct dictionaries, um, things like this. Uh, I think Brazilian at the moment are going through a big grammar change at the moment, and you know they need to find out what's the latest word they should be using. Because a lot of our players would be fairly educated, you know, they know what they're to expect. And in German, like if it's a sharp assess or a double S, I mean, you know, they, they want to know that you know what you're doing. Because if if they're reading stuff that's crappy German or crappy Dutch or whatever, they're, they're going to want to just play the English game. Um, and it's really important as well that you get a really good language. Now, one of the problems that we have with, with our language is that we can be restricted by length restrictions and truncations. And this goes back up here to the developer. Like we always ask them, don't, don't develop games that have static strings. We want dynamic strings. So we can write away for German or for Dutch, particularly those languages, where they're quite long. And we don't have to compromise on a really particular word we want to use. Now, as an English speaker, I find this very hard to understand because the game is in English. I mean, how many ways do you say a particular word? But in other languages, they have such a, a choice of words they want to do. One of the games that we did recently was um, Mystery Chronicles the Trails of Love, right? I mean, um, if we can make a bit of a competition as to how would you say the trails of love in your language and make it sound really nice. And people have different ways of saying that in their own language. And particularly, a lot of the English ones here, um, they'll have, the, the titles might be a pun. Um, like Mystery Chapters, The Void. The Void was actually, Void was the name of the, of one of the characters involved. It was their surname. And so it became a, a way of how to use that, but also make it sound like, it, basically it's about, it, it, they go into this whole um, other realm kind of thing. And it's like a void, there's nothing there. And for the translations, it became a way of how do you make it sound sexy in a marketing way, but also tied to the English version. So for us, um, this whole idea of language is it, really important. And obviously, like generally, translators will come from Know, pretty strong linguistic backgrounds, they will have skills in this area. Um, but it's really important that they, like we, we always get gamers in as to our translations because they know what's out there, they've seen other games out there, they've seen the kind of pitfalls that people can get into. And if you have a horrible kind of language used that's very stilted and it's not really flowing very well, gamers hate it. And I suppose it's kind of like if, as an English speaker, I suppose it's like looking at a, a foreign language film that's translation to English, and, and you, you know that it's if it's French, you know they're like oh, I'm going on French novels, and and you can see in English it's very tight, you know it's only a couple of words or something, and you know you're missing out on something here, and, and that kills me as an English speaker. Um, but it's the same as well for for a foreign language player of, of any of our games, you know, you want to kind of make it sell to them. And we do we, we do get a lot of comments back. We have a German person um, who does a lot of blogging about games, casual games, and she's said that some of our games are better than the English version um, because maybe the developer wasn't a native English speaker in the first place and it was English or this kind of language. Gender and formality and informality and all this causes huge problems for us, particularly when you're, as a translator, you're just translating out of context and it's, you know, give that to me, what do you mean by that, la 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 la, and, and it doesn't say who's the characters speaking to each other, and if you're working in a language that's, um, we do Japanese for example, and, and it's very important that you get right, you know, formality and formality and all this. Um, or those players are going to be like, this, this is too informal of a game, you know, I, I don't want to play it. Because don't forget, our demographic was up to babies in their 60s, you know, and they're playing our games, but they don't have a particular view of how they feel people should interact with each other. So, it's really important.
and my game characters are correct. Um, we tend to try and advise um, for game names, uh, character names, that there aren't things like Sam, is it a girl or a boy, or names like that, like Joe, or things. We, we want like a man name and, and a woman's name, so it's very clear who's who in, in the mix, um, and you're not trying to get into level 13 to try and see who this particular person is. So that's the translator, and obviously then there's the usual challenges for the translator of the tools and the broken files and you know you're looking at the source file and you can see there's a whole bunch of strings here that didn't get picked up by the tool here. So there's, there's, there's endless issues here as well where the translation really would be good if they had an idea of translation code as well so that they could try and see what's going on to kind of things. Hidden objects are a huge problem for us as well. Um, is it a pipe? What's a pipe? Are you smoking it? Are you getting something with it? Um, is it draining water from the roof of your house? You, you know, what, what goes on there? Uh, bats are a big one because we have all these mystery type of threats. So, you know, you can have a flying bat, you can have a, a baseball bat. Uh, wrenches, I mean, geez, I, I'm not a tools person. There's a million different ways to draw wrenches, as far as I can say. Um, loads of different types of games. So, we always try to get hidden object lists for referring to or whatever. Um, the testers then. Um, they're going to hit everything that the translation is working to do. So you've got your truncations, you've got your length restrictions. And in Big Fish, our testers are linguistic testers, so they'll actually fix any linguistic issues that they find in the linguistic as well. Um, so they will change some of the, the text over here into whatever things. Then obviously there's your functional books. There's your situation where you're translating in French. And <coughs> Extended characters don't appear. You know, where's my accent and graphs and all this? Um, this can be a big problem here. Um, so this again ties up here with this dude here, you know. Dynamic text and to make sure it actually displays ISO curve. Um, and I have here a variety of other issues which you could have a whole lecture on itself that just this one. But anyway, these guys here, if this system works here, it tends to be a lot better than these guys here. And then obviously the project manager, they're trying to manage the expectations of the team. So when am I getting my files back from the build? Um, when am I getting the last How many updates and source controls here? Um, my license for Travis is expired. And the tester is just freaking out about everything because they never have enough time to do what they want. Um, and then obviously they're also managing budgets and that kind of thing. And I find this a big challenge because I'm not really the money person and I have to be very organized to do all that. And you never know how much money is being spent. You think it's going to be this, but it's going to be something else. Um, so expenditure, all that kind of stuff is, is something that um, as a project manager you really need to keep on top of. And stop all these people here spending money because he always wants to get the sexy cartoons. And this person down here is probably not very happy with what's going on and you know might be trying to upwork and things like this. Um, and this person here is always threatening to quit because they've got all the information on what's going on and you don't want them to it to Nintendo or something like that. And, and then this person up here obviously, you know, it's just like what the hell is going on? I don't know what transition is. And you keep telling me this is very different. So it's it's like communications and all this, it's just something like scheduling. Um, I had a great schedule when we had three languages, now we have eight. And it became a complete mess back in January. I was working pretty hard today. And then I found project. Project is the bomb. Your project manager, I love it. Um, I'm very visual because I love shiny, colored things. And GAP charts, I don't know if anyone's seen a GAP chart. Yeah, GAP charts are great. And, and you've got like your long line here, and you know they're busy here, and they're busy here, and then you're dealing with this whole bunch of 23 creation translators, and you're showing them colored lines, and they can see, yeah, I'm supposed to do that on Wednesday, and then I'm supposed to be finishing that on Tuesday, and starting something else. It's brilliant. It's much better than me saying, you have to do this, and this, and this, and everyone forgets. So, colored lines, it's good. Um, if it goes past my three-year-old niece, I know it's going to work in our team. Um, these guys are so, so creative, but they're just not interested in the schedule. They don't want to know what's going on behind the scenes. They're not 
challenge, it's someone I do fit just want to know when am I on the next game, what is it going to be, you know, um, what style is it going to be, uh, what language am I going to use, I mean, oh my god, the, these guys could talk forever and they love their job, you know, they really love the, that they could be translating some kind of mystical thing and then they could be translating uh, your straightforward flow is stacking dishes in the diner and, and then doing some other kind of a mastery. I mean, they love that it's so creative when they're doing different things all the time. But I'm not a translator, so I don't really get all of that. So. But this is where the communications come in. It's keep everyone happy, you keep everyone talking to each other. Um, so yeah, so my tips for developers, for any of the developers, this is for you. Um, know about localization and internationalization prior to coding. Oh, if anyone wants um, to see on me, and I can send you on this. this um, uh, I would advise standard code, uh, cache to friendly code. Um, organize the files with identifiable strings from translation. We got a game in recently, right? There was maybe 8,000 words, 50 files. And I was asked to get a preliminary workout. I was like, I'm not doing that. Which for the engineer to cache the file. 50 files. Um, yeah, you don't need that kind of thing. So, organize files with identifiable strings for translation. Yeah, don't have like the string <coughs> that's crucial to the plot embedded and nested in the layers and layers of code, you know. You'll um, never find it. Um, set development schedules and code freezes. Now, as a project manager, this is my big thing. Don't say, yeah, yeah, we're finished, we're all after a group of holiday, and then realize, hang on, uh, we need to rewrite the last level or something, you know, set it in stone and then walk away from it. Um, and as much reference material as appropriate because as for the translators, if they don't have their hidden object lists, you know, it's going to be a nightmare for the testers if they're translating pipes and pipes and, and bats are coming out of their ears and everyone's just, you know. Um, so for localization engineering people, uh, and by the way, these are, you know, if any testers here, this could be interesting as well. Um, as because I was saying, it is good to know what's going on in everyone else's place to help you see why this person is crazy and what's happening. So from the engineering, find a catch-all tool suitable for the bulk of incoming code. So as I was saying, we use Tradus, um, which is a great tool for kind of bits and bobs that we get. Um, we don't tend to do a lot of website translation in, in our um, department. Uh, the website you know, the Big Fish website is done by a different department. If you're doing a website in Doc, a different tool might be easier to use. Um, no, I'm not, like, Travis will work fine as well in those of them. But um, I know in the past that, um, just from working in our group, that, that um, other tools might be a bit easier just because there's not as much code and it's easier to strip it out and visualize it. But you're not making it yourself. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so a catch-all tool that's appropriate for what you're doing um, would be a good idea, or else you're going to be using 10 different tools and they all cost money. Um, and familiar, familiarize yourself with all the other roles. Um, and then get connected online for other support. So as I was saying to you earlier on, Travis support are our friends, you know, and my localization engineer and the guy that we deal with in the help desk, they're, they're constantly kiss-assing each other on LinkedIn and they're recommending each other it's, it's, you know, that's the way to go. Um, because we know we can ring this guy up and he'll, he'll, he knows what our problems are. Um, organization is paramount, or the project manager, which is before you get. Um, and communication is your friend. So it's the same, like I used to be an engineer, and like engineers tend to come from, and I, I'm not, by the way, I'm going to make generalized statements here, except for this one. Um, <laughs> we're computer scientists. You know, where geeks you sit on a computer all day, you know? I, I was back in the days of online chat rooms when they were first invented in 97. This is really cool. You're talking to someone you don't see because then they don't have to look at you. Um, yeah, communication from, is it's like a learning tool. So, yeah. E email is, is a good one. Um, or use what we call Spark, is like instant message. Um, if you're an engineer, you need to really get up on this one because problems are in fact. Um, and expect the unexpected. So I, I think I had that in the synopsis. Um, yeah, anything will happen. It amazes me. 
you know, developers will always find a way of doing something new. We have 500 developers, every doc that we get is a different one, and you, you wonder how you manage it. Then figure it out. Um, and so translation tips for, for all your translators. So as I say, play me some of the game so you know what's going on in the game. Um, and then decide on the game style and stick to it if possible. Creating style guides and, and your linguistic rules and all that. Um, be aware of ambiguous hidden objects, bad English or source language and, and genders. I mean, I'm constantly getting instant messages from my team. I'm the only native English speaker in my team. And, um, you know, what does this mean? The real McCoy was a reason one. Actually, some of our developers are saying they're from Eastern Europe and they, they, they catch on to English phrases and they go with it. And you, you get this really bad English and then some crazy English phrase in the middle of it, which is a bit weird. You know, you're not expecting it. So, so they asked me a lot about these phrases. Um, sometimes it's, it's misspelling, this kind of thing. It can mean something completely different. Um, sometimes we have hidden objects that are quite archaeological because we get a lot of things that have worked in the past. So generally you look at it and say, well, what does it look like? Um, and it, it might be some kind of tomb for a ship that no one's ever heard of. But if it looks like a compass, you'll say it's a compass. Um, so sometimes you just have to be a bit creative with that. And then this is the, a, a big one as well. Um, if you know who the tester is, decide on how much work, work you're going to be doing versus what the tester is going to be doing. Um, so sometimes um, we get work in that maybe the tester might actually translate because it's really small, and then they'll ask us to do the proofreading, and then we can go back and say, well, did you check lengths? Did you check this? Did you put them to the file? What did you do? So it's good to know where the translation scope stops and where the testing scope starts, so that you're not doing, no one's doing the same thing, right? If two people are dropping names and they're checking, you know, what, why do two people need to do it? You need to be snappy and to get these games in your very quickly. So um, know what the tasks are, who's doing what. And know that the other person can do the job properly as well. It's good to have faith in your colleagues and, and know where the limits are. Um, and so then from a testing point of view, so I don't think there's any testers here, but um, the translations might share, yeah, the translations might yeah, be interested in this. So linguistic, functional, everything else. Um, and then obviously you have a situation here where you've got the incorrect language, type of the grammar. Um, inappropriate language, as I was saying, familiarity, gender, lots of genders cause so many problems for us. Um, hidden objects, bats, pipes, bows. Um, you'll have like a violin bow stuck in the corner. You know, like, where's the little dick? Um, length restrictions and truncations, as I was saying already, they cause a lot of problems in the developer is still set on having a static flash in this thing. Um, and then from the project management point of view, keep everything moving. <coughs> Communications, um, organizational order, processes. Um, in our department, the other lead with me, she tends to look after the processes because she used to be a translator and she's now a translation lead. So I say to her, you know, hey honey, like, what do you think about introducing a new tracker for tracking your work? Do you think the translators will go for that? And she'll she'll know from a kind of a cultural point of view if, if people will if it'll tie in with what people are doing or if it's so removed, you know, if, if it revolves a kind of a thinking shift to the day to day, will they remember to do it from the game? So um, the two of us work quite well um, as as the leads because I come from one background and she comes from the other. And we fight all the time. But we keep the communication going, so it's kind of, I buy a lot of coffee. Um, so, process, oh, so, so I'm saying project management here in processes, but this is kind of a, the person who's kind of steering the ship, basically. Um, so processes and big picture. If someone in the loop doesn't have the big picture, we're screwed. And I'll tell you that now. If someone needs to know what's going on. Because if you have a salesperson paying the developer loads of money to give us files, and then someone's over here packing them for travels, and translator is translating away and then the tester and then it comes out the other side. If someone is looking at what's going on and knows what's going on, it's going to be really, really hard and it's just going to be an endless nightmare. So it's really important and generally I think this tends to be the good role um, to have the big picture view because they're talking to pretty much everyone in the site um, because of the scheduling and the money that's going on and 
processes and the chaos of the origin of the So, um, yes, um, So, if nothing else, communication, transparency, ask for help, and collaboration. And you'll have a happy, casual games localization site. And then you'll all be jumping for them. <laughs> so, that's me, don't I? Translator who can learn Snangler will I get a game player who might be able to teach you how translate. What we do in those situations, and, and this is where it goes into the are you translating or are you localizing point of view? We are, so as I said, our translators would be very strong linguistically, and a lot of them would come from different backgrounds. Some of them would come from um, the kind of um, safe place. If you're doing an English course, for example, in college here, you know, it might be cultured English, or it could be um, a different type of course using grammar and all that kind of thing. So we might have guys who are very involved in, um, might have done study poetry and classical kind of language, or you might have people from all other areas. And what happens in those situations is that, and we get a lot actually, is we get a lot of poetry and puzzles and that kind of thing. And in those situations, you're not going to translate, because if you're translating, um, Say twinkle twinkle little star, right? Well, we'd be a lot in, in English, twinkle twinkle little star, uh, <laughs> it's a nursery rhyme anyway, right? But in Germany, you might have a different version of that, um, this is like another type of a nursery rhyme that children are very familiar with. It wouldn't necessarily be that one, but it might be another one. Then they'd use that. So they're localizing it as opposed to translating it. So in a game, if you've got star like, hey dude, how's it going? And some guy is running past with a surfboard. Um, in Brazilian, for example, they might have a different kind of a slang that they use in surfing speak, and, and they'll do that. They they use that slang instead. They won't just translate it for a different. So language. they're more like subject matter experts, I think, than yeah. the translations. And what we have in our team at the moment is um, we have. We've got this website called Team Genius, and everybody um, put in a few areas that they're experts in. So to say, like, we, we have everything. We've translated all different types of games. So we've one person who's really into ancient Greece, for example, and we did translate a game about the gods and all this. I mean, there's a lot of stuff on Wikipedia, but this girl, the, the guys went over and sat down and said, okay, you know, tell me a bit more about Zeus, tell me a bit more about Hera, all these kind of things. And she was able to give them a little bit more kind of information than you just get on Wikipedia. Because you'll always get the information somewhere, but it's, it's good to kind of get different versions. Um, so the Team Genius thing, we've, we've got like who's the experts in what areas so that they might be able to give a bit more information and a bit more flavor, basically, is, is what you're getting. You might get that flavor on Wikipedia. But I mean, you can't be an expert in everything either. Um, like we've had a game recently where I was in, in the lunatic asylum and somebody ended up in an operating theatre and there's all these tools and everything used. And somebody sent me a message and I was like, what's this particular tool? <coughs> it was called um, a surgine, S-U-R-G-I-N-E. And I know we agreed that this was English and that we think the person was trying to say it was a syringe. And um, so, because at the end I said, look, well, where is it? And he goes, it's in an operating theatre. And I was like, well, what, what's in, and he was showing me the pictures. I said, oh, look, there's a syringe, we go with syringe. I mean, you know, you just go with what you can find. <laughs> Are you relying on these 23 translators for this? For? You said there are 23 translators on your team? Yeah. Uh, does that extend on a virtual level, or? Um, no. <laughs> Really, so so the, the, the you've model, got these 23 people doing all this stuff yeah, with yeah. six or seven titles coming in a week. Yeah, but um, we release, so first German, um, Spanish and French, we release a title a day. So we seven games a day, oh, sorry, sorry, seven games a week going out the door. And maybe four or five of those will be translated by our department. So you could have see you could have very small games and maybe a thousand words, two thousand words, and they'd be turned around in a day. 
or you could have a bigger, I mean, we tend to do about 2,500 words a day. Um, so generally, they can fit in around, around that area. So um, our newer languages would have less games a week going at them. Um, until, I mean, if we start launching more a week, then we'd obviously say not to get more competitions in. But we try and keep it internally because um, like we have we have a couple of excellent vendors that we use and you know we've, we've tried out different vendors and we've gone with these guys because they get what we want or they give us what we want. But we find the more in-house stuff we do, the more consistency we have. So that's why we particularly want that model. Mm. And do you have a, a, a use by date with your you know, translators? Do you finally start losing a link with the mother country? Um, no, they all go home um, on holidays and that kind of stuff because they work within their own team. And I mean, like for example, our Spanish team at the moment, we've got one guy from uh, Barcelona, we've got a girl from um, Valencia, and we've got a guy from Granada. So even themselves, like the guy from Barcelona is not Spanish speaking, he's Catalonian, uh, particularly since last weekend when it's Barcelona. <laughs> so, uh, so they're very, they're very, um, strict about their languages as well and actually two of them are currently doing distance learning degrees in linguistics and, and that kind of thing. So they're, they're, I mean, there's a bunch of people in the department who are so passionate about their language and everything. They just keep up and, and they're, they're always talking to each other in the language. I mean, the only time they're probably speaking English, even though they're all fluent English speakers, right? Because I mean, you couldn't, they're not supposed to be translating English names or English names if you, if you don't speak um, the, the language. But um, they're, the only time they speak English really used to be, or if they're talking to their other colleagues. And I mean, we have other people in the team. I mean, one of our Italian speakers speaks Spanish. Um, one of our Germans speaks French. You know, they, they speak different languages as well. So they're generally they're, they're speaking in their own language. <coughs> and see, the thing is as well is that um, yeah, like when I first started off, I was working in a vendor company, and the selling point was, oh, we've got all our our translators are a nation and they all live in the country. But I mean, these days, I mean, you know, we've got cable, you can get your Spanish station on cable or, you know, so it's not like you're so far removed from your language that you're never going to see it. I mean, they're, I come in in the morning, they're all kind of reading the newspapers from the country most of the time. So it works very well. So thank you. And there is something for helping these translators to be sure that they know exactly how is it said or um, denominated something in their own language, even though they cannot know all different phrases in their own language, because even <laughs> a native speaker many times ignores certain domains, they're corporate. And we have very good tools, CAD tools, to use this when we translate. And translations are going to be perfect. If we, if translators know how to, to deal with these good materials. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, there's a huge community of translators online. And the thing is, as well, is a lot of these guys are freelancers. And a lot of our guys came from the freelance environment. And they're very used to working remotely anyway and being online and constantly um, blogging and talking to each other. So whilst yeah, I mean, maybe the ideal situation could be that they're living in, in each other's country. The reality is they're probably not <coughs> using it too much. Um, our guys mostly have been in Ireland maybe a couple of years. Um, yeah. There is a lot of research nowadays compiling a lot of materials uh, within all different domains, colloquial, formal, um, specializing technical, language so I'm sure that you can live all your life in Alaska that you you can access to very good um, Spanish material or German material updated and I think that day by day, by day is becoming more and more the problem is that it's not very well known by translators and I, that's why it's very important to to get updated with the new technologies. The other thing as well is that um for us anyway, like okay, like our language is, is for Spanish for example, it's Spanish, but we're trying to also market it for Latin America as well. So we kinda have a mix of Spanish. Um, 
Brazilian as well, like they want to, they, they tend to not use a lot of Brazilian slang because they know that the Iberian Portuguese people may not really understand it either. So they try and use a kind of a soft version of slang. And it's, it's I mean, Chiquipa is like, I'm from Cork, right? I mean, I've got slang that I use that people from Dublin wouldn't understand. Um, or ways of saying things that people from Dublin wouldn't understand. So, like, even the way I would speak here, is, is, I modify some of my language as well. So I think sometimes it can be very good if people are taken out a little bit and they're mixing with other people from, from other parts of the country so that they can understand. When I was in Seattle recently with the German being with me and I, like, I got so much of my local business being there with me in Dublin for 10 years of living there. And I, so I'm very used to speaking to people who aren't Asian speakers and I would speak a lot slower than I would normally. And we ended up in a pub in Cork and had won the All-Ireland the day before and I was, met some guy in, 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 and we were talking about this. And Connie said after, she's like, geez, Lisa, she said, I never, I never heard you speak English like that before. She said, I actually didn't understand what you were saying. <laughs> and your man was from Armagh, right, which is in Northern Ireland now. I mean, he, he very strong in Northern accent. But she said, initially, we were like, oh, I'm going to work and she said, I, you know, and like, what? <laughs> so I said, see, I would never, there's no other real Irish people in the department. Now my boss is Irish, obviously, but we'd still speak quite slowly to each other. Because um, that's the way it is. So I think you kind of modify yourself subconsciously. Have you, how do you get feedback from customers on the translations or recommendations that you get? We get feedback. Um, we get, so we have, Big Fish Games have huge commitment to customer service and that's we're known for customer <coughs> service. And we have customer support in all our languages at the moment. So we get people will write us will write into us and just say, you know, really like that game and the language was particularly good or we get people writing and saying, you know, it wasn't you know, didn't really like that game, I didn't understand what was happening here. Um, we have dedicated um, forums in French, I think, and German as well, um, there, where there's a lot of chatter online there as well about what we do. And I'd say we do have our, our um, reviewers or whatever, like industry reviewers over there, and they do a lot of reviewing them on our language sites as well, and they give reviews for the actual language. So that's how we know. Um, we've one girl now, um, she actually works for a professor of ours. But she, she has said in the past that she thought one particular game that we did was even better than the English game because and the English game was horrible. I mean, they, nowadays we have a production team who works with the developers and cleaning up the English language and making sure that the English customers know what's going on, you know, and make it, you know, as I say, make it look as professional as if a native English speaker had written it. But um, with this particular game, anyway, some stuff went through the cracks. It was one of our first ones. And the German, whoever did the German um, translation, was a really good English speaker and could figure out what was going on and, and did a great job in the, in the German. And it was recognized as being better. So, yeah, so we, we get a lot of good feedback um, from, from our customers. I mean, we have a customer base who are just, I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Um, they just have such ties with Big Fish. I mean, like they email us constantly saying, oh, you know, you're, you're part of the family because the computer's in the corner of the room and Big Fish Games and we constantly be thinking, they email us, it's so easy just to drop off an email. We, um, so um, I'm a German, or an Irish speaker, right, um, but I would be a translator and um, my, um, my goal in work at the moment is to really plug Irish and so uh, we were out while I was out like, drinking with my colleague in Seattle who came over in February and went to the pub and had loads of wine and then he said wouldn't it be brilliant to do a game in Irish you know for St. Patrick's Day and there was a really small game <coughs> going through at the moment like 600 words and so a friend of mine is a translator in Irish and we got the game translated into Irish and threw it up on the website um, for, for Irish culture actually and um, they um, you know the guys in Seattle were like what kind of tickets are we going to be getting from the help desk about like this um, and no one speaks Irish. You know, what are they going to be saying? They're all panicking a bit about it. But um, so I think we should be linked here to the Irish. Um, but anyway, uh, 
we did get one ticket in, and it was from a girl who said, hey, you know what, I'm so happy. She said, game works great, but even better, um, I'm, I'm learning Irish at the moment, and there's no Irish games out there, and I'm just really happy. Thank you so much for your game for doing this for me, you know, and I'm So uh, I got an innovation award for that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and it made the company a few bucks. But it's, um, it's that kind of thing that I love, and that we have. I was living there for a while. Um, is he still there? Pardon? Is he still there? If you yeah, it's, it's all over this. See some green, right? So, yeah. So, Irish language version. Um, and see, it was, so it was for St. Patrick's Day. Um, and that's great, like 600 words. So, basically, it, 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 it's. Um, is there any point? There's a. The goal and shall let an all bonus in the story, so that's um, easy to match with bonus case. And it's great, and so my friend is a translator, and she she's actually works in the Department of Education in the North. Um, she's from from Fermanagh, and like diehard Irish language speaker, as you tend to be um, when you come from the North, because she just happens so hard to get it. But she, she's translating, you know, statements from the minister every day. And then I said to her, look, you never do a game for me, which she? she was like, what the hell? She doesn't play games at all. And um, she's in the middle of, it, of doing a dissertation on, um, on translation. And now she's like, oh my god, gaming, I never realized all the different types you have. Because she was planning on doing a science fiction book, but she was like, you know, I'm not really into science fiction. So I've been giving her all these different types of games to look at now. She loved this one because it's all about demons and ghosts and it's cursed house and you're wandering around trying to, it's all mapped through, right, so there's hardly anything in it. But uh, she just thought it was amazing and she was like, oh, how would you, is a demon a demon or a devil or what do you use? And, and like it was so small but she just loved it because she said, you know, it really made you think a lot more creatively than the latest press report from the, the minister that she, that she had, you know, so it was a lot, you know, which you could potentially machine translate. Um, but yeah, this one for her, she loved it. So. Um, I mean, I guess most of the companies you look at, they're probably usually doing, what is that, 8 to, what, maximum 20 languages? Or? Um, our, the, the languages we do at the moment are up to nine. So we have Japanese in Seattle, and then we do um, German, French, Spanish, Danish, Dutch, Italian, Brazilian, and Swedish in Korea. What do you think would convince uh, publishers to look at extending that to 40 or 50 languages? So when I was in Nordic Game, that's, this was what we talked about, was if um, what makes publishers go for other languages and the smaller language uh, uh, markets. And I think a lot of it is um, if people are there buying the product. So for us, as I was saying, we have a huge customer base. We know where all our customers have come from. You know, we have, um, so, we're really lucky in that because we're a distributor and we sell games, you sign in, you give us information. We have so much information on our customers about where they're from, um, what games they like. I mean, if I come back here and I go into um, games you love, it can tell me the kind of games, because it, it tracks us all in cookies, it tells me what kind of games I've been looking at recently, which are match three games and some mystery ones, because that's what I look at. We have all this information on people. So we knew when we were going to, um, maybe launch for Danish and Dutch and that. We had customers already in, in that, those markets and, and would they be interested in going. So for us, if we're moving forward into other languages, that's what we'd be looking at is, is there a, a customer base there? Do they have the technology? So you need English speaking customer base first? Yeah, in yeah, you need an English speaking customer base. <coughs> or we get requests as well, people do. I mean, we've had, we had a, our HR girl is Turkish, right? And a, a request came in, and the person said, look, it was like really bad English and saying, you know, look, I'm from Turkey, la la la, and you know, they weren't making a whole lot of sense, but they were trying to play this particular game and got stuck. And the, the customer support guys sent it up to the HR guy and said, look, would you mind just replying to them and see what, you know, what we do, because you speak Turkish. And we were, in, we were able to engage that, that, that um, player. So they were playing match three games because, you know, you don't need a lot of English to play match three. It's very straightforward, you can figure out what's going on. But I mean, if they indicated that, um, you know, there's a lot more, you know, we can see that there's 
more customers cars in Turkey, or we can see that there was this burgeoning base. I mean, we need you need to have broadband. You need to have particular infrastructure to be able to get this, the games from us. You know, I mean, like my mother wouldn't be playing these games because she's at home. She still has dial-up. She lives in the middle of, of nowhere. You know, she's not getting cable or anything like her house. So she wouldn't be able to play these games at home. I mean, you're literally looking at things like that. You know, um, so. For us, it's it's what's the demographic, you know? I mean, like there, you know, our games are being aimed at, well, the, our games are being bought by women, 35 to 65. Is there a culture for playing games in, in the, this, 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 these countries? Are women playing games in these countries? Mobile and iPads and iPhones for us have become really, really popular, and our games are doing really, really well. And now they're starting to target other demographics that we hadn't gotten before because a lot of older people may not necessarily have iPads. It's kind of the younger generation at the moment are buying these iPads, and they're now seeing our games online. So it, it's it, there's constantly markets opening up the whole time, and if Places like, you know, if we find we're getting a lot of customers from places like Turkey or places that traditionally wouldn't have um, a lot of people playing games or a lot of people who would want the game in, in their language and we can start seeing that there's a demand there, I mean, it's certainly something that, um, that people can look at. But th that's, it's market driven, you know, I mean, that's the end of the day though. I mean, it costs money to, to localize. So we try and keep the bulk of our customers happy with localization, but I mean, a lot of people will say to you that they prefer to play in English because, you know, they, 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 they whatever reason they want to know, they, they want to practice their English, or some people may have had a negative experience in the past with, with their localized products. So, I mean, my best friend is Dutch, she doesn't read books in Dutch anymore because she just says, she's been to the speaker and she says she's read enough Dutch books to know that the English books tend to be better. It's really, it's really down to um, the, the, the market and the demand, I think, as well. So maybe in the future, I mean, we, our operation is very scalable for more languages because we know, I mean, I come from 28 language translation and I've said already, you know, we need to have an operation that we can, if we, if we went to, say, Polish or Russian or Czech or some other kind of language or, you know, Chinese or Korean or any of these kinds, we can literally scale, you know, we, we have the bold structures in place, we have the organization in place, the source control, we know everything that needs to be translated, and we have all the information in the reference material. It's scalable, we can just farm it out to a vendor, or we, we hire a translation that we do in place here. But I mean, um, that decision doesn't get made until we know the customers, I mean, if someone's not going to buy the game, we can to the translation which means. But yeah, it's a good question, though, because it's something that they're really looking at at the moment. Um, it worldwide, you know, and a lot of people want to do the machine translation because I think it's the easiest way to get it in the bed. But then, then this poor person over here is never going to play a game and then they don't want to listen to English. Sorry, I know I'm, I'm hammering it. No, I'm just not that fond of the machine translation. I was curious, how do you promote your games? I mean, how do you sell on the website? <coughs> so, um, we sell our games yeah, online and this is the .com site, which is the, the English one. You've got your